welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hi. Hi. So I have a piece of paper this time. Do you know why? Well, you wiggled my piece of paper. No, I just wanted to prove to everyone. Okay. Although there's, we're on video now, so it's easier. Yeah, we have, we're Sorry, video, if you forgot. To us in your earbuds. Um, the video is on YouTube now. So if you want to see our magnificent faces, here we are. And if you're already watching us on YouTube, hi, I have a piece of paper. <laughs> um, the reason I have a piece of paper, Ken, is because I wanted to talk about the some of the taxonomy, <laughs> the the labels. The ways the, the the ways that we can label different forms of non-monogamy. Okay, and so there's, a there's enough for a glossary taxonomy thing. Yeah. Okay. So Great. The reason I wanted to talk about this though is very specific. It's not. I mean, there is an academic exercise to just like get into. Hey, what are the different ways people describe their relationships, and what are the labels that they put on these relationships, and what do they mean? And I love, I love me some taxonomy. I just, you I just, do. You're a, you love a label love maker. Categorization. <laughs> yep. I just love it. My brain thrives in categorization. Um, but that's not really why. I wanted to talk about this because when, when I'm working with people, often they see a sort of distinction early on in the transition from uh, a mono paradigm to a poly paradigm and i don't just mean polyamorous i mean like we could also be talking about monoculture to multiculture we could be talking about monotheistic to polytheistic we're when we're shifting away from the mono into the multiple it's tempting to imagine that there's like one box we get out of and another box we get into yeah i see and it's so much more nuanced and complex than that which is part of why i feel very at home in this world, teaching about this stuff, guiding people in this way. I love the complexity of it. You love you some nuance. You do. I do. But early in our relationship, I had to deal with somebody who was <laughs> anti-label. You love you some nuance, me not so much. Well, and the thing is nuance. So you actually had you liked nuance. It was a combination of didn't want any label at all. And that's fair yeah. enough. Mm -hmm. And yet, it led us to some trouble. I'm going to build this house without a hammer. <laughs> well, okay. We had, we had, it's, it's a missing tool, but, but here's okay. the trouble that I noticed. Um, and I didn't have words for in those early days. It's that we were trying to build a new relational style that we didn't have any models for. We were sort of imagining it, we were dreaming the dream forward. Yay, us. But we were also trying to do it without labeling anything, which gave us a real problem because we were not doing a good job of treating each other with exquisite care. And one oh, of the ways we could hide <laughs> that's for sure. misdeeds and misunderstandings yep. and all of the ways we were mistreating each other was in not labeling stuff. Because if there was no label, if there was no taxonomy, if there was no description, if there was no, this is what we're doing and here's what it means. If we did not define our terms. Yes, th there it is. As we went along, we could say, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. I, that's not what I meant I was doing. And when we shifted into having some shared language, and actually starting to write stuff down. Yeah, this is what actually. I mean when I say it changed how I felt about our very complicated relationship. And it let me start not just describing, it wasn't just about our relationship, it was about how I described myself in the world. It gave me language to 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 help me feel seen again after having been invisible when I left monogamy. I plunged myself into this complete invisibility because all the people around me did not want to see that. 
it made them pretty angry, in fact. And most of them didn't acknowledge that anger, but wow, they acted angry. I hate feeling invisible so much. That, I. That is one of the ways that um, that I didn't treat you well during those early times, and to what I'm what I'm hearing the way you're saying it right now, well and you didn't treat you. Say, oh no, I will be having a label. You cannot have one if you want. But uh, yeah, I'm having mm -hmm. a label because I need this language, and label may even be too strict a, a word for it. I need the language to describe my relational structure because that's how I will feel safe and seen. And, and this... if you choose not to accept that, that's up to you. And we could have honored each other's mm -hmm. realities there. But I felt like I was um, pressured to accept this, this magical freedom of not having any labels. Yeah. It didn't feel like magical freedom to me. So one of the things that can happen with with projection of me saying, here, you you hold all my stuff and I'll I'll watch you. And sometimes it's you hold all my good stuff. Sometimes it's you hold all my bad stuff. Yeah, I'm like, hey, would you not have any labels now so that anything that goes wrong can be your fault? <laughs> I mean, this it's is, how it, it is how it played out. And what I, how I see it right now is this, this is related to the explicit communication, implicit communication issue, but but at a complete, like a, a much more complex level, um, because without explicitly saying, this is how I'm going to categorize this. This is the thing that we're talking about right now. Do you agree? And then we have that conversation. And then once we've come to a conclusion shared about meaning. a shared meaning yeah. about what this is, now we can talk about it and now we can work with it. So here's the thing. The first pillar of successful opening up in my book is enthusiastic informed consent that informed part is very important oh yeah and mm -hmm. in order for it to be informed consent i need to be able to communicate what it is i mean when i say i am available i am let's have a relationship okay what kind of relationship now if you don't want a label what i hear is you don't want a short word or a short phrase to describe your relationship okay cool you can have lots of words but i in order to be able to enthusiastically consent in an informed way we do need to have words language is the technology that allows us to have relationship yeah Language is the tool that one doesn't of... have to be verbal language. Nope. There are lots of ways writing can work, nonverbal things can work, but it does need to be shared meaning behind that yeah. language in order to do relationship. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about this because I also see it. I see it not just in my clients, but I also see it in my own life day to day now as I make new relationships, romantic, friendship, um, collegial. I'm always trying to figure out how to express authentically what I see this relationship being and trying to help them help me. Like I'm trying to help them explain themselves to me too. What, how, tell me about your, your non-monogamy. Tell me about your relationship. Tell me how you see our relationship forming. And frequently I see people struggle to put into words what they mean when they say I'm in an open relationship or or I'm available or I'm polyamorous now not everybody I'm I've heard some beautiful amazing explanations but when someone struggles to tell me what their relationships mean what the parameters are of their relationships how they how they mean to be expressing themselves becomes impossible for me to make relationship agreements with them. So this is how, for me, it's connected to that and explicit that's, agreement versus implicit assumption. Yep. And and I, I have to be able to, in order to provide consent, in order to actually be relational, in order to honor your authentic otherness, your autonomous, sacred otherness, I need you to share some language with me. 
And that, Which might mean that we actually decide not to relate to each other. Right. Which is a gift in itself. Yep. That's actually been one of my favorite things learned dating is when someone can describe to me exactly what they're looking for. And I can say, that's great. Good for you. I'm not a good fit. But thanks. Thanks for playing along. This is great. I love that. Finding out I'm not a good fit for someone is a win. Because why would we want to force something that's just not a good fit? Yeah. So I have a list. The so reason let's, I have a yeah. piece of paper is because I actually made a list of the things that come up frequently when I'm talking to clients or when I'm speaking publicly about non-monogamy. And I think the most important thing we could possibly say right now is this is how we talk about these terms. Right. You yeah. have to define the terms for yourself. And so each time we describe one of these labels used in the world of non-monogamy, take it with a grain of salt, a great big grain of salt. Yeah, it's informed by our life experiences, our shared conversations that we have had, the meaning that you and I specifically have landed on Yeah. today. Right, and there's the thing. Every time I, I talk to another person, I notice that my own descriptions get more... Um, more practical, but mm -hmm. also more expansive. And I, I notice all the different ways that we can use language to express different things. Like the same word might be used to express yep. different things and, and different words might be used to express the same things. So with oh. all those grains of salt sprinkled all over this, let's and, get into it. Okay, let's get into it. One more, one more um, plug for why to do this is when I do this, I understand myself better. I mean, yeah. every time we have this conversation and I define, you know, I, I work my way through, what is it I mean to say, oh, that's it there, I got there. Well, the next time I'm thinking about it, that'll be closer to the surface. And it, and it just and builds more, a clearer understanding of who I am. And you're growing and changing. Me right. Too. Mm -hmm. Yay. You're Yay. alive. All of you listening are alive right now. And so since we're all growing and changing, sometimes when I look at a list like this, I notice that I I have changed. Like, oh, I actually fall into kind of a different category. Mm -hmm. Huh. Fascinating. Um, or I notice that different relationships fit into different categories. And that also leads me to question, like, what's going on for me right now? Am I transitioning? Am I changing? Yeah. So and this isn't yes. this isn't just an academic let's also a good way to find out if you're people pleasing or fawning for one partner uh oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely that, yeah that you have this one relationship that doesn't fit into mm -hmm. the yeah okay yep. we can circle back we can come that. back to that so let's get into it um okay let's start with do we have to do do we have to use this label yes we have to use this label there are there are two big ones right off the top Okay. Um, consensual non-monogamy and ethical non-monogamy. These are the two that I most frequently say talked about as umbrella terms, an umbrella term in meaning that they could be used to describe lots of different styles of non-monogamy that fall under these broader general labels. But I think it's worth briefly just breaking them down. Consensual non-monogamy. It has some problematic aspects all by itself, just using those words. If we're first off, if we're talking about non-monogamy, um, well, then we better define what mon monogamy is. And if we're talking about consensual non-monogamy, we better define what consent is. So monogamy is such a complicated thing to describe because we... We take this term and we give it so much meaning. We ask it to hold so much. So when I'm talking about monogamy, I'm thinking about um, all the different domains in which I might be exclusively paired with one other human. Okay. That's what I'm thinking about. All right. So monogamy in a sort of conventional sense, right, tends to mean two people who are together until they're not. But there's zoological folks, people who think about the zoological basis of monogamy, and they tend to think about species that mate for life. 
there are vanishingly few and all primates are not do not fall into that category like we just like mate for life and then like if our mate dies we're just done and primates don't do that don't do that so monogamy is already kind of a, a a bit of a mushy term but like for the premise of this conversation we can just say monogamy means one person at a time and um and in in a in a and so that's where you you said it was an umbrella term and you said in in a set of domains right. and there there you go there's all the all the different ways that you can be monogamous well okay so let me clarify okay please no, do so monogamy right if monogamy is about where i am exclusively paired with one other human okay now i would have to consider what domains now conventional monogamy would be about being exclusively paired with one other human in sexual the sexual domain the um emotional domain probably the householding domain when i say conventional i mean like okay it's 1950 in white america this is what's expected of you it's not even necessarily what people do but it's this like picture that we have the norman rockwell picture okay it has nothing to do with reality really <laughs> um but let's just imagine that monogamy means exclusive across some some big domains like um shared finances um parenting sex emotionality friendship practically i mean people yep. often talk about i'm married to my best friend yep. and the focus is on a couple Okay, so now that we've just established that, non-monogamy then would be anything that's expansive of that couple, which would include cheating, which would include taking the monogamous paradigm and saying, well, um, yes, we're monogamous, I've agreed to that, but I'm doing something else <laughs> and I'm keeping it a secret from you. So that's cheating and that's also non-monogamy. However, it's not consensual. Because they didn't provide the opportunity to agree even exactly okay. okay so that's the basically understood definition of cheating so now we add this other word in front of non-monogamy to denote the idea that this is no, no no it's it's good everybody got a chance to say i'm in and that's the word consensual consensual meaning that consent is freely given it's reversible it's um it is enthusiastic it's it's really important that consent is not under duress. It's not under pressure. It's slightly problematic to talk about consensual non-monogamy, though, because it kind of kind of ladens the term non-monogamy as if like as if it's more typical that non-monogamy would not be consensual. It kind of asks well, non-monogamy to to prove itself. That's the thing about phrases like that. The the qualifier consensual implies that if you take that away, what's left is not consensual. Right. And so, so tricky and, words. And this has come up in, in non-monogamy communities because we're always actually trying to figure out how to be less problematic. That's or at least that's my, been my experience of of community has been that people are really genuinely trying to um identify where we are accidentally causing harm that said i think the phrase consensual non-monogamy does help convey the idea that we are in a situation that has been agreed to by all parties okay ethical non-monogamy another phrase that is often used um so consensual non-monogamy is often shortened to cnm ethical non-monogamy is often shortened to enm Ethical non-monogamy means different things to different people. That's that's what I've found over the years. It most of the people that I come into contact with are using it fairly casually to just describe the same thing that consensual non-monogamy. They're just saying like everybody, everybody's everybody's agreeing. Except the word ethics means something. The word ethical means something. So let's talk about that part of the so yeah. to Terms. my mind, I can only use the word ethical non-monogamy, that, that particular phrase, if I am clear about the, the frameworks and the decision-making processes that I am engaging in, in my non-monogamy. So like what your ethical framework is in your 
Yeah. In, in how you approach yep. non-monogamy. And not everybody okay. is there yet. Sometimes as you're trying to um, disentangle yourself from monogamous culture, it takes time to actually understand what your ethical basis will be, or you just haven't been introduced to that idea. And, and so this is a place where I just find ethical non-monogamy to be a pretty, it sounds great, but I find it can hide a myriad of sins. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it can make you feel good about how you're doing relationships without you actually doing good about your relationships. Well, now I'm, I'm in, I'm moved to ask the question, um, what are ethics? And I ask that because I realized that I couldn't say that I was ethically non-monogamous because you talk about ethical frameworks and I actually don't think I know enough about what ethics are to, to engage in them. And if I don't know that, and I'm saying ethical non-monogamy, I, I feel like I'm, I'm leaving it to some external definition of ethics. And what you're doing is actually leaving it to the other person's idea. Right. Uh -huh. As you communicate this, you say the yeah. word ethical non-monogamy. Whatever they think is ethical. Exactly. Okay. So that's what I find is most people yep. are using ethical non-monogamy in a very practical, pragmatic way. They're saying, I do my non-monogamy in a way that feels ethical to me. But most of us aren't using like really well thought out ethical frameworks. We're not doing that because we haven't been taught to. I don't like, I get that. And I'm not, and I'm not condemning anyone for using this phrase. I just think that we should be a little bit more cautious about how we use it so that we really don't accidentally imply that we're further along the path than we are. I still, I rarely use this phrase because I feel like it, it implies a level of um, ability to think through every decision at yeah, it just feels so big to me. Yeah, I, I'm still working on it. I don't feel like I have enough grasp of my own ethical ethics to use the word and know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I, I, so again, to each their own, you get to use this phrase if you prefer it, but I do think that there's an interesting conversation. Let's come back to that and actually do an episode where we can break down. Hmm. And I have somebody we could talk to about this who knows far better than I do how ethical non-monogamy might be enacted well. Great. That sounds cool. Okay. Let's go forward though. Let's move. Yes. Don't ask, don't tell. Okay. It's about as far away from ethical as I could get fast, I guess. With with, <laughs> with your ethical framework. Yeah. So yeah. here's the thing. Um, don't ask, don't tell isn't necessarily problematic, but it's not necessarily consensual non-monogamy either. The way that don't ask, don't tell winds up working in practice is Let's say you have a couple and um, they have agreed to be open, but they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it. So after the decision is made, they go about their independent businesses doing their things. Where this becomes problematic with the consent is how exactly do I give ongoing, reversible, freely given ongoing consent if I don't know what you're doing and you don't know what I'm doing, how do we it's continue to give? Certainly like, not informed. Help. <laughs> I don't know. Give informed consent. Yeah. So the way that I see this come up is really like, how do we practice? How do we use good practices around safer sex? If we are not sharing information. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes problematic pretty fast. Now that said, some people have agreements about what sort of sexual information they will share or what sort of health information, because COVID certainly brought up other realms of health information. They may have limited parameters that they, they, they follow or some very specific ways that they handle testing, or they may be in a relationship that doesn't have sex. And so maybe that's not an issue. They may be in a relationship that doesn't share finances. So there are places where a don't ask, don't tell relationship can be perfectly great and well-suited. And they may be able to provide appropriate levels of informed consent because of the places where they are exclusive in their relationship. They just don't need that. So I don't, it's not necessarily bad. However, I see it happen frequently that people get into don't ask, don't tell because they're afraid to have the conversations mm -hmm. or they don't know how, or they don't know, they don't know whether they'll be safe if they have the conversations because they haven't figured out how to yet. This, this is, this is um... what I specialize. And this is what came up with, um, for me, when I think back on our early relationship, there were so many conversations that I just didn't have. I avoided. 
because because a lot of things but uh, well, you had practiced don't ask don't tell for years mm -hmm. with your first wife yep so it probably felt pretty normal to you yeah. to continue that way and and that didn't line up with your um i ask and tell everything well your your <laughs> needs and desires it's um that that's not the relate that's not a relationship that you want to have and and I was offering to have a good relationship with you that you wanted to have, and then I would I would do that. So I well, over the so, even just the definition of good, a good yeah. relationship to, to you was level and steady, and even right. yep. a good relationship to me was the ability to flex between. Mm -hmm well, a mess in either direction. Yeah. It was the ability to experience the highs and lows of life and to disagree and and then have the conversations to come back into homeostasis. Right. Into and I didn't know that was a thing that would bring back homeostasis. Right. <laughs> um, Which I, I get it. Lots of people were taught and were modeled that not talking about things is how you maintain steadiness. Yep. I have not found that to be the case. And it's definitely not the case with complex relationship structures. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the next one on the list though is I think my favorite and understanding. <laughs> Great big air quotes around the word understanding. <laughs> understanding. When people say I have, I'm open and they tell me, you know, we have, a, uh, we have an understanding. And what they mean is they imagine that they have consent from their partner. But generally speaking, after I dig in just a little tiny bit to ask some details, what they have is an imagined conversation that they had in their head um, that allows them to, um, to imagine that they have the, the, the relationship that they want, where they have expansiveness and the ability to act beyond their monogamous bounds. So still maintaining the entire look, feel, and surface rules of their monogamous bounds. So they never really have the conversation. They just imagine that this is fine because nobody's told them it's not. Well, they also never brought it up or asked about it. But, you know, I'm understanding. So, okay. Um... I don't like this one. And I'm not even going to pull my punches. I don't like that. I don't think that is a mature relationship i don't so what i hear you describing sounds like here's our relationship here's our monogamous relationship if you put your thumb over this or maybe your whole hand and we right. just block All out that piece and that's yep that. we're just going to say that's fine so that's a deal breaker for me if somebody can't describe to me their relationship structure but at any point they try to talk about how they just have an understanding, I'm like, yep, good. We're not a good fit. That's fine. That's a deal breaker for me. I'm not interested in being someone else's secret ever again. Yeah. And I'm definitely not interested in facilitating someone else not having conversations. I actually don't feel obligated to uphold other people's monogamy. That's not my job. Their job is to deal with their monogamy. But I am not interested in literally facilitating people not having conversations. So that just looks I'm I'm looking at that personally. with the quotes on the word and right, that's a deal breaker for you because it's a euphemism. It's a word used to hide other words that haven't been said. That, that is that doesn't work for you. That is like that is the opposite of the skills that you teach people to do relationships well. And I teach these things because it is, it is not, it's my values. It's my paradigm. Like this is my, this is my life. This is my life's work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it matters to me. If you are comfortable with the people who say that they have an understanding, I do want to encourage this. The data shows us that people who are cheating on monogamous relationships um, are less likely to use safer sex practices than people who are um, having the conversations and negotiating their relationship agreements to be non-monogamous. So 
I would double down on your testing and make sure that you're taking care of your sexual well-being if these re relationships are sexual. Um, and I would also take care of my financial well-being and things like that because people who aren't having conversations make me suspicious about what mm -hmm. else they're not having conversations about. So. Okay. Okay. Next one on the list. Um, I'm, I'm actually just going to switch these, Ken, because sure. I think this one's important. An open relationship. I think that this is actually the broadest term we can use. And I actually like it because if you don't yet know which of these labels works for you, I think it's a good middle ground to stand in. It's, it provides a level of awareness about, okay, so we're open. In other words, we are no longer in the closed container of monogamy that is exclusive across multiple domains. But maybe we haven't figured out exactly what open looks like yet. Maybe we're still exploring. Maybe we're still experimenting. Or maybe we just like the way that that label allows us both to flex. Because actually, I can yeah. use that label with you now, mm -hmm. and it feels perfectly fine because yeah. we've practiced letting each other grow and shift and change and be at different places. Well, so it's okay. What I what I like about it is that it's um, it's it's in the positive, first of all. And it's not making a claim of monogamy or polyamory, or it's not making any other claim other than we're going to see what happens when we take down this box right? and start designing whatever it is we want to do. We're not, we're not, uh, like, like we don't necessarily have a precise vision for where we're going. It also and I like that. It also doesn't assume that your, your relationship has to hinge around sexuality. Yes. Right. Right. So the next term I want to cover is one that I use all the time, but I don't hear used very frequently. It's creative monogamy. Now, obviously, it's got the word monogamy in there, so you wouldn't think it would be on this list, but I think it falls on this list. I think that for me, and, and I'm the one that came up with this phrase, so here we go. <laughs> um, creative monogamy is about specifically deciding and being able to communicate about the domains of life where you are exclusive and where you are expansive. And so creative monogamy, obviously, right? It's right there in the words explicitly. There's some monogamy. In other words, there are some domains that have been intentionally, explicitly chosen to be exclusive. And yet there are others that are expansive. So an example of this would be um, someone who has decided that they want sexual fidelity, and then they define what sex is, and they decide that sex and everything that they just described in that is for the two of them. But let's say they've decided that they want ex emotional expansivity, and let's say they've decided they want householding expansivity. So maybe they have housemates. Maybe they have really, really integrated friendships where they take care of each other's children, and they are there for each other, and they're in community. But they've decided on sexual fidelity. That, for me, falls under creative monogamy. And the reason the word monogamy gets left in there is because some people really do feel held by the that, that container. Wherever it is that they've chosen exclusivity to exist feels really nourishing to them. Great. For me, this is all about can you communicate that to other partners? Yeah. Because if you can, if I can communicate that to these, these other people in my life, I'm in good shape. And here's the thing, it could go the other way. It could be that sexuality is the expansive area, but other areas are where you are more contained and exclusive. And that brings us to swinging. Swinging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, swinging also is also called the lifestyle. Um, I know the phrase falls into and out of vogue, and I know some people like it and some people don't, but- Everybody but, knows what you mean when you say it. Yeah, what do yeah. you mean? And um, there's shared meaning to that one. So when I say swinging, I'm just talking about people who've intentionally decided to explore um, multiple sexual experiences, which doesn't have to mean that they're having any particular sexual experiences. Some people are into what's called full swap or soft swap, a full swap being I, I mean, even as I define these, I'm like, yep, I've been in different containers where people call these different things. So I've seen people call soft swap anything up to including um, having a few couples in a room and people are are 
with each other's partners and there's a certain amount of sexual contact that's allowed again big air quotes because i'm not sure whether the word allowed is really what i would use there the bottom line is swinging is about sex and it tends to be exclusive around emotionality and a deep emotional connection so it i would say that swinging falls under the domain of creative monogamy because in fact you you define the limits of where you're being expansive around the sexual piece, the sexual fun. Another way to describe this is polysexuality. And some people find that that term describes them more appropriately. Swinging just has the wrong connotation for them. So polysexuality, yeah, the, the expansivity on that, on that spectrum of expansive to exclusive, the expansive stuff is in the sexual realm. Which then leaves you in a spot to start defining what your sexual realm is if you haven't already had the conversation what is sex you need to have it you can actually go to my website joliehamilton.com you can click on the button that gets you my five my my five top relationship yep. guides one of them is the guide to the what is sex conversation if you haven't had this conversation already do it do it no matter what kind of relationship you want to have. If sex is going to be involved in it in any way or is going to be ruled out, let's like find out what it is because that will help. Also, just if you're interested in getting to know somebody better because... Yes, I have this conversation with friends. Guaranteed you, what you think is sex isn't what other people think is sex. Because yeah. we could have we could have a whole like episode or multiple episodes on what we think sex is and there's just no point because it's not what you think sex is. Well... I mean but it's fun but it's fun it's fun conversation <laughs> it's a way to simmer and yeah yeah if you're looking to simmer sexual energy talking about what you think sex is can be fun okay so what else we got in there we got monogamish let's get to monogamish tell me about that one that one actually i don't have a good handle on dan savage um coined this term and it's it is a helpful term a lot of people like the term monogamish and i think they mean something similar to what I was defining in creative monogamy. But in creative monogamy, we are getting really specific and explicit about where we're expansive and where we're exclusive. Monogamish is a little bit more fluid than that. It's it's a little bit more along the lines of, well, you having sex with somebody else isn't a deal breaker, or you having sensual experiences with someone else isn't a deal breaker. So yeah. And it may include edging toward openness. So monogamish, again, there is this word, like monogamy is in the root. So there is some emphasis on the maintenance of the monogamy, the exclusivity, the couplehood. And so when somebody tells me they're monogamish, one of the things I know is that I want more details about what their monogamy looks like. And one of the things I can ask them is, tell me how that feels for you. What do you love about it? Because I've partnered with people who consider themselves monogamish. And one of the things that works really well for me about that is great. Tell me more about it because I want to support you in feeling that way. I have no, I have no desire to interrupt that. Tell me how I can support you. So that that's a useful thing for you to know because then, or, or me, if I'm dating, because then you know, the, some of the parameters of the relationship you're going to be having with this person. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it allows me to understand where I fall on any given hierarchy, which we're going to get to very shortly. So next on the list is polyamory. All right. So this one, I get to use my line. Polyamory is a frisky conglomeration of Latin and Greek. <laughs> um, yep. Poly meaning many, amor meaning love. So polyamory means many loves. Great. Um, it still means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And when someone says they're polyamorous, I, I absolutely ask them, tell me what your polyamory is like. Tell me what that means for you. How does it look? How does that, how do you act it out in your life? Because there are so many different ways to do this. Um, I describe myself as polyamorous, um, but I could have easily described myself as polyamorous when I was in a monogamous marriage because I fell in love with multiple people the whole time I was married. 
but I never acted on it. And so by the way I define it now, I'm like, well, I don't know. I kept falling in love with more than one person. Sounds many love-ish. That sounds me like me. <laughs> and, and so what I hear you. Like he didn't have any problem with me falling in love. I just wasn't allowed to act on it. And so I hear you separating out the acts from, from the beings. polyamory. Yeah. Like I, you, um, in my research studies, I have run across this too. I have had multiple participants show up and say, yep, I am polyamorous. I fall in love with more than one person at a time. I do not act on it. It is not up to me to decide that somehow their behaviors mm -hmm. are what make right. them polyamorous. I mean, you don't have a ton of outside partners at any given time. You're not likely to because you don't really care for dating a ton. Yep. Or at least not right I'm not, now. I haven't been particularly drawn to it. Um, and so I find myself thinking about that the same way I think about my bisexuality. Am I bisexual if I don't have sex with men? Because I don't know, I'm too lazy or it's too much work or, you know, whatever things, but like, but I would, and you have. but I don't, and I have, so. You have all this evidence. Yeah, but am I. Identity isn't defined by your behavior. Right. And that that's the. And, and so and it's just a really, that's a clear way to just treat people humanely. Mm -hmm. So at the start of this conversation, I said, I want to talk about how we treat each other really well. Yeah. And in order to treat each other well, um, allowing people to identify in the ways that feel authentic to them mm -hmm. is really important. And also that's letting key. them redefine themselves. Yes. That's key. My queer husband. Yes. <laughs> Um, who has been continually told that he is not queer. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not sure how much cock I need to see you suck before that is well accepted. I because it's not none. I guess maybe I should hand out pictures to the people who aren't believing me. Oh, I don't know. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So this episode is no longer safe. Yeah. For... Okay. We've just kind of that's fine. Um, okay, here's the thing though. When when we sort out identity from behavior. I also still need to have more conversations because my my given parameters around like what my risk factors are might I might need to know right. some of your behaviors yeah. in order to make informed consensual decisions. And so I might want to know behaviors like like what kind of sex you engage in. And whether you use protection and whether you use um, barrier methods. And, and I might want to know that for my own reasons. In fact, I do want to know that. We have an agreement that we disclose whether we're having non-barrier sexual contact. And we have a very clear description of what that is. Yep. And that has nothing to do with whether we identify as gay, straight, bi, whatever. The, the behaviors, right? Yeah. Do you have contact with a penis in this way? Do you have do you have vaginal intercourse? Do you have like all these yeah. things? And so allowing people the complexity of defining and describing to you their identity and letting that stand apart from their behaviors and just holding the frame of that, like letting that be, letting letting that be true that someone's behaviors does not make their identity. Um some people really struggle with this. I think um, a 25 year old me would have really struggled with that a lot because I was so pedantic about whatever you do is who you are. I remember struggling with those thoughts too. And so at that point of view, I got to tell you, your humanity really up levels when you let go of that <laughs> particular. I felt yeah. much calmer about how I could treat people with the respect that they just deserve as humans. I, I've also found that it uh, I it, that less. it it in, it includes an awareness of my own entitlement and privilege because not everybody can act the ways they want based on their identity because of some risk factors in their lives yeah or some back societal back do. pressure and right. um I mean that that goes on what and on access or just access yeah it's so access like you don't necessarily have access to the kinds of sexual experiences that you want mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with your identity you don't have yeah okay i could go on yeah so so you're right back so when we're talking okay. about polyamory i like to really encourage other people to describe to me how that word many loves 
how it plays out for them, how it feels to them. Some of the ways that this can work is people might describe that they are solo polyamorous or that they are hierarchical polyamorous. And when somebody says they're solo polyamorous, I, I always lean in and ask them to tell me more because I have heard so many different beautiful descriptions. Um, the one that resonates very easily for me is a solo polyamorous person who just told me I'm, I am my own primary partner. I, I am my own primary partner. In other words, my relationship to myself is the, is of the utmost importance to me when I think about sexual, emotional, and all, like all of the ways I care for myself. Cool. Some people use solo polyamorous to mean that they are not open to cohabitating. Um, I've had research participants who described that solo polyamory for them meant that they had no interest in being labeled as a couple ever in any way. Solo polyamory can mean a lot of things, just like all these terms. And it can really help people describe how they want to be treated. Like I, when people will like share with me the depth of their solo polyamorous identity, I often know notice that even just as a friend, oh, I know more about how you want to be seen and treated as a person. So I, I really love that one. And you may find yourself married to a solo polyamorous person at some point for exactly that reason. I, I hear the, um, right. I, well, I, I hear the, uh, the resonance in that of. It aligns really strongly with how I am yeah. in the world. And um, you, yeah. So you mentioned, um, treating each other well and, We've, we're gone through, there's more to this list, certainly. And as we go through it, I realize one of the ways that we can treat each other well is to let everybody be in their box and not try to push them into another one. Yeah, not saying, hey, you don't fit that label. Yeah, yeah. not try to fit that label and not to say, um, mine's better. That's actually, so there's a the thing, maybe you don't understand somebody's label, but um, yeah, that is the thing I find the most common is, yeah. And actually, I just had an email about this this weekend from, you know, from a well-trained sex therapist. Um, and it said, hey, I I, uh, I hear that non-hierarchical polyamory is the best kind. So how do I find out more information about how to do that? And I instantly hit reply and said, okay, let's start having this conversation without, because <laughs> it's honestly, it is so Oh, it doesn't even make any sense. Using the word best. Use, yeah, in, saying that in any sentence, non hierarchical and best. Mm -hmm. The irony was so thick. I could cut it. <laughs> okay. You know what? I, I heard you say that. I didn't immediately see that. That's, um, I, oh, that is, I, I that, that's irony. I that just doesn't even make any sense. So let's just say, from, from my perspective, and this is this is my personal perspective, but this is also my professional perspective as somebody who has helped a lot of people navigate a lot of different styles of non-monogamy, calling yours best is never going to work well. That is not a good way to treat each other humanely. Right. But maybe even more importantly, trying to prescribe a... Um, trying to prescribe a particular way as best, even if it's not yours, instantly introduces so many, so many ways to other, so many ways to cut each other off. And start having in-groups and out-groups. Yeah. And, and it misses, I think, one of the fundamental points of having um, these complex relationships, which is to co-create them with other people mm -hmm. and to bring deepened understanding of how how we're doing this I thou things when I think about hierarchical relationship structures which you and I definitely have one right now yep. um, and we do it's mostly practical it's um, because we have shared we have a lot of shared children who all happen to be in college so it's really expensive and we have a house together the practicalities of our life 
right now make it so that it is it is genuinely difficult to imagine how we would not have some practical ways that we are primary to each other because we have we have made certain commitments to each other about how we're oh, going okay. to yeah. about the logistics of our life and those life. um being able to communicate that yeah to other people yep is the kindness that I can do. Like that's what I can do. I can be I can be kind by being thorough in how I express what I'm available for and negotiate that. And sometimes that means I'm not a good fit for someone and that's okay. What bothered me about this this idea of what the best way to be non-monogamous is was that I'm more concerned with how people communicate to others what it is they're seeking and what they're doing. Because as soon as we create best, some people, maybe even most people, will likely feel some pressure to conform to that standard. And to try Isn't to that exactly what we were trying to escape. That 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 is a barrier to authentic communication. Because now, oh, that's best. I'm gonna try to fit that mold. I don't. And I know I, do. I don't. I'm gonna try to make myself look like I do, which as soon as you've done that, you're which now we're kind of back to the whole ethical, the ethical yeah. non-monogamy problem. I think a lot of people use the word because it sounds good without necessarily knowing whether it's a right fit. Maybe it is. And that's awesome. And I'm I am so game to hear from people who are who are interested in, in defending these positions because I'm I'm here for people who can describe their relationship. But if you feel like you have to conform to somebody else's idea of what is the best way to do relationships. That was exactly the thing I was trying to escape when I left the monogamous paradigm. Because I wanted to leave the paradigm of mono, of one, of one way. So, um, heading down the list, we get rights of relationship anarchy. Relationship Hooray! anarchy. Um, we had an episode very recently with Laura Boyle. I think I thought she did a great job of describing relationship anarchy um, as a principle. Relationship anarchy can be so helpful as a way to describe um, having having done your best to be mindful of removing the, the idea of inherent structural hierarchies and, and allowing relationships to be what they are and not prescribing an importance and not prescribing a specific way that they have to be and allowing these relationships to be what they are and allowing them to change and there is a there's a manifesto of relationship anarchy let's link yeah. that in the show notes because it's very short and it sums up relationship anarchy and what i noticed is and somebody in um the year of openings current cohort um pointed this out she said um and that relationship anarchy whether she's doing that or not the principles of it are simply like they're they're pretty juicy principles to just dig into as a so as a thought experiment, I'd read the the I don't know what is it like fourteen hundred word yeah it's relationship not long at all so it's it I've read it probably two dozen times over the last decade and or when whatever how many years I've seen it it's a good read it reminds me to question my own stances and how I'm treating my relationships including how I'm treating myself in right. my relationships. So. And this is where the, the nuance and multiplicity comes in. We started off talking about taxonomy and categorization and labels, and they are they are so important for communicating with each other. Um, and now we're at the other end of this list, looking at anarchy, where we start to dismantle them, but intentionally, and after having talked about what it is we're dismantling. Yeah. So in in when I first started looking at that, I was like, I see a I see a like a, a problem here. I, I don't see how we can do both, but you, it, it is the, the multiplicity of here's the structures, here's the things that we use and how are they serving us and how are they not? Yeah. And, and that's it. So it's in the critical discourse. thinking and the discourse it's in the dialectic of relationships. That's where we can make sense out of all this. Um, okay. We've talked about a bunch of styles and now I'm going to toss one in that isn't really a style so much of non-monogamy, but it's a phrase that comes up that I think has so many people fall into this particular parameter that I think it's worth naming. Um, 
Polly under duress. Oh. So. Well, duress doesn't sound good. Yeah. So the idea of Polly under duress, I really, it's not, it's not a relationship style I think anybody would choose. Um, in fact, I, in my book, you, like, we, we can't, like, that's not. The definition of duress is that you haven't chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. Polly under duress um, is a phrase used to sum up feeling that you have no other option but to be um, polyamorous in order to maintain your relationship. This is tricky because this gets us very close to trying to describe like what it's okay to have boundaries around and what it's not. You know, if in other words, if you and I are in a monogamous relationship and you come to me and say, so I'm polyamorous. What do I like that label? First off, I don't get to decide your identity. So what if you have that identity? Okay, maybe that's okay, cool. Maybe I'm not cool with you saying that in public. Okay, but that's my thing. Do I get to decide what you get to call yourself? Okay, right away we're into them. So we're, we're in some into some stuff. And then we get into the behaviors. How do I want to act? What what happens? Are you opening up our relationship? And what if I haven't consented to this? Do I have to feel like do I have to open it up from my side too? Or do I have to? And I've seen people wind up feeling like they have to open up on their side because their partner's open and they're like well it has to be balanced it has to be even there are a million ways for this to play out poly under duress is sort of it's it's the antithesis to having informed enthusiastic consent however it happens a lot and one of the ways that i see it happens is people aren't always feeling empowered to say no not everybody feels like they have agency. Not everybody does have agency and autonomy in their in their life. There are a lot of uh, are power of structures things. and power um, differentials in relationships that make it's it the culture. There's so there are so many systems of oppression and layers of oppression that can be interwoven to create a system where someone may not be able to offer enthusiastic informed consent. And this gets really, really tricky. Um, I mean, an argument could be made that um, at least so many relationships, an argument could be made that they began as poly under duress or open under duress. I have seen many of these relationships resolve that duress piece by seeking guidance and help and, and getting to a spot where they can agree where they're going to be exclusive and where they're going to be expansive. But I've also seen a lot of people not resolve this issue because it's just so painful to realize that they agreed to something that they didn't mean to. And it can be so painful from from even from the from the person who who may be in the more pressuring position to come to terms with it. Oh, I, I put this I put my partner who I love into a position where they felt like they had no choice. That can be really, really hard. Mm -hmm to be with long enough to come to some new resolution, yeah. to outgrow it. So sitting with the, the reality, being in the space of, this isn't actually what I want. And now I recognize the mistakes that I made it, in some really basic level consent behaviors, really uncomfortable. It You've is. certainly been in this spot. I have, I have, um, I have. I've, I, yeah. I was in this spot. I mean, I brought to my my first husband, like I'm in love with someone else. And I, it wasn't about behaviors. I told him I could control my behaviors, but, but the ensuing conversations were increasing. It made it increasingly clear to him that I wasn't open to changing how I felt. I wasn't going to try not to feel this way. Now he decided to leave rather than, than stay in that. And I, I think that was the right decision. I really give him a lot of credit for claiming his stance, he, for knowing what he needed. It was it was not a pretty end, but it was clear. Like he he knew what he needed. He knew where his boundary was there. Yes. But I remember a time when the two of us were dancing back and forth with a lot of control. And a lot of it was was implicitly exerted control in both directions back and forth mm -hmm. to try to maintain some sort of equilibrium about around are we doing this or are we not because it wasn't just a cut and dry i presented the idea and he was like nope 
It was far more messy than that. So I've lived through this. I've watched other people live through it. And I think it, it made this list for me because I see it so frequently that I think it actually becomes for some people, for many of us, it becomes a period of time during our non-monogamous existence when we're like, oh, yep. And you and I experienced this to some degree where I was definitely not poly in under duress because I, I came to you wanting to be, but I certainly was under duress in the relationship. I, I was in a yeah. secondary position having not agreed to be in a secondary position. Yeah. And then I was told a good seven months in, I was told that I was secondary and I was like really shocked. And so negotiating that meant there's a period of our relationship where we, I was under duress. I felt like I had to choose to be secondary or be nowhere or just disappear. I didn't even know where to live at that point. We were living together. It was really, really complicated. So making peace with that as being part of the story yep. and and part of our evolution as a as as a relationship how i make sense of our life and hold and and how i make sense of my part of that being the one putting you under duress participating in it um is all the conversations that i would not have so that things could stay implicit which would keep the duress in place and keep things from changing in ways I didn't want it to change. Yeah. And knowing knowing that and knowing that the conversations that that the dialectic that you were talking about, the okay, let's share our ideas about how we think this should go. It's it's still possible for the duress to exist, but it becomes much harder. Well, that's there's the thing. Once we started having the conversations, mm -hmm. there was a, something was going to happen. Every conversation yep. and all the because we we're having conversations, the time began to change the relationship. Yeah. And eventually we were able to negotiate one that was um, fair and allowed us each to be, um, well, in, in agency in this relationship. Um, the next one is, I think, one of my favorite here, queer platonic relationships. Queer platonic. I put it on this list yeah. because okay. I, it's such a great way to help people understand that the point of non-monogamy isn't actually sex <laughs> and you know many listeners i'm certain are out there going yeah we get it it's not all about sex but lots and lots and lots of people the original inspiration for opening is around sex or sensuality or some sort of erotic openness and so it can be hard to imagine but there it is it's not all about sex um the the one of my ideals, in fact, like one of the things I, I really want in my life, but have not had um, for any long period of time is a queer platonic committed long-term relationship. Um, it, it's challenging because in, in the life I lead, um, I, it, it's so outside of the bubble where I live and how oh. I live, it, it, yeah. it just is. But a queer platonic relationship is one in which the parameters of the relationship clearly do not include sex. The word platonic's right there, which again means you need to describe what sex is because it may include cuddling. It may include snogging. It could include all sorts of things. I use the word Did snogging. Did you say snogging? I That's, it. yeah. love I that word. Kids were talking about it, so. Yep. Yeah. They were talking about it because they didn't like the word, but whatever. I like it. Um. So, the whole notion though, just the notion of breaking open, like, wait a minute, relationships don't have to look one way. Queer is about disruptive. So di disrupting yeah. the status quo, yeah, right? Turning everything on its head and saying, oh no, we're going to define our relationship and our commitment on our own terms. That's the basis to me of queer platonic yeah. relationship. And and I like it because it's like, it's we're, we're putting our elbows out against the the pressure of isolation of the of the particular culture that we live in here in the united states in in cold new england in cold new england um yeah but i have found it tr it's tricky and it's it's a lot of work over the course of any given relationship that i've had that's fallen into this category um over time so none of them has lasted more than a year even though they were all intent like you set out the best of intentions and um, the call of monogamy has ended a bunch of them. 
which didn't make any sense to me because the whole point because was that we were this these things should be able to fit together it's been very confusing but i think that this is this is what we're dealing with the reality that a lot of us really struggle to to maintain a stance of i will live outside the cultural container so just know that if you want to live outside the cultural container there are labels that might still be a good fit for you so that might be one um another great one is bdsm non-monogamy so kink non-monogamy so this might be non-monogamy that is limited in some way to the the kinks that you have the bdsm practices that you have so this might be a non-monogamy that's specifically focused on um kinky activities or on a power exchange um it's it's a really interesting one because the two communities the bdsm community and the non-monogamy community there is an overlap right so in that venn diagram right in the center there lots of people there's there's a lot of people who overlap in that in those two realms which is cool and frequently folks who aren't in that in in those circles imagine that bdsm is synonymous with sex but in fact it's not there are so many different ways for bdsm to be enacted um so this might be about sex might not, might not. but it is about some sort of vulnerability exchange so there is a level of of exchange of erotic something power something right that's that's inherent. intimacy intimacy of something of something um the negotiation of something and so i think that that's it's also an, an area where many people that i've worked with have found there's um there's a more easeful set of language to describe the kinds the multiple kinds of relationships you might have and the way a relationship might change the dynamics might change so BDSM related non-monogamy, um, really complex, big topic we could go on and on about, but there it is. Um, I'd like to talk in just talk a little bit here as we come to a close, we're almost at the end about some of the ways that polyamory might be enacted. Okay. So uh, when we talk about polyamory and that many loves, some people are going to include all of the parts of their life are going to be like folded into their polyamory. Um, and some people are going to enact this in different ways. Um, I, I have some clients who describe themselves as polysensual. So they, they have drawn a boundary between sensuality and sexuality. And, and so they, they sort that. Some people I know have used this term polysensuality to describe themselves because they are asexual. So they're not interested in sex, but they are interested in sensuality or polyromanticism because they're interested in romance, but they're not interested in sex. So first off, there's a lot of ways we might add nuance to the concept of polyamory. And then we have adding other words like polyfidelity, which might mean a group structure that has more than two people all in a in a really a set of relationships right and they've agreed to a certain closeness now that closeness might might be able to be negotiated over time but there's a fidelity to it so perhaps within this given group of relationships let's say there are five people perhaps they have agreed to okay but this is our closed circle we don't date outside of this circle um polyfidelity doesn't have to be a forever thing some people just describe it as being a forever thing some people describe it as being um, a thing that they do for a period of time some people do it and then renegotiate as they go along and they meet new people and they say oh we'd like to expand or perhaps someone leaves the polyfidelitous situation so there's a lot of ways for that to play out um but it's worth noting because a lot of times people imagine when i'm talking to them about the different structures they make choose they imagine that if you're open, then you're open and you just have to keep accepting any and all people. Okay. I see the, but, the, the poly fidelity is um, it's, it's a definition of the boundaries of your, not everybody's open to everything. Your group, right. And some people want a level of stability of number of partners in their life. Yeah. You get to negotiate for whatever you want. And you have to remember that, you know, all of life is unknown. So everything we're negotiating for, we're negotiating with other humans. So the uncomfortable truth is 
the unknown and the unknowable. Happen. What we're trained for. <laughs> yeah. Is what we're here to do. And we're all autonomous. And we get to grow. And change. And change. And monogamy doesn't make any promises it can keep. And neither does non-monogamy. So mm -hmm. we do have to remember that, yeah, these are humans we're having relationships with. So another um, way to think about this is the shape of a particular polycule. So a polycule is a way somebody might describe their polyamorous group. That might be a closed group that's polyfidelitous, or it might be a polyamorous group that is a polycule that is open. A polycule, like a molecule, get it, cute. Um, a, molecule, a polycule might have the sh a particular shape. Now, the one that we most often see, like the monogamous gaze of polyamory is the, and that's gaze, G-A-Z-E, <laughs> monogamous gaze of polyamory is frequently a male, female, female triangle, a triad, right? And I'm using that in the most cis, hetero, mononormative way on purpose, male, female. I don't even know. You like, can see the eye roll on YouTube. <laughs> okay. It's very I, trite. It's a trite picture. I love dating women. I've been... And, and I've been in this form of triad. Um, it's great, but like it is so, it's a trope. It's a trope. Yep. It is not the only way things can work. Also, sometimes there are three people involved, but there is only one, like there are only two relationships going on, not four. Um, it, it's so, it's so individual and it might even change over time. If you had a triad, you have a triangle, great, but then if two people break up, then there might still be the V relationship. So some of the ways people will describe their polyamorous polycules is to describe them in shapes, like an M or a V or a W or an X or a quad or... Poly a connect the dots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the phrase poly constellation. I like the constellation word a lot. Yeah. I like it because it also reminds me that some... There'll be there may be different distances between the people. There may be more and less involved relationships between different people. And we are all connected a bit like a web. But those relationships don't aren't de they're not determined by some pedantic set of like this is how this is how relationship works. There might right. be lots of ways and they might change over time. Um and then you have different ways that people describe some of their polyamory, like kitchen table polyamory, which a lot of people describe this to me. Meaning that what they, their ideal is that all their partners know their other partners and they can get, a, get together and hang out and they, they can play games and they, they maybe babysit for each other and they, ha and that's all great. I, it's not always like it, it can be hard to find other people who want to do the kitchen table poly thing with you. So yeah, that's just true. Um, so you could want it, but also not have access to it. You could also want it but then find out that practicality wise it just doesn't really work out some of your metamors your your partner's partners may not get along um yeah that's just how it is there's also laura boyle boyle has another term that i really like she said um garden party polyamory it's not like a kitchen table like we're not all getting together to necessarily make the exact same meal and eat it but you know we can all get together literally like at a garden party and we could wander around and know each other it's a, a little bit more casual relaxed have a conversation atmosphere. over here, go over there, have a different conversation. I I like the the image of yeah. that. It, mm -hmm. it draws up something that's a little bit closer to what I typically see between people who have multiple different, not just relationships, but areas of their life where they're yeah. having different friendships and different relationships over, evolving over time. I like that particular way of, of talking about it. So, okay, that was a okay. long list. So there was a long list. Um, and of course... I'm sure there are more and oh, will be course. more. And I'm certain we did not get this all right. Right. And I'm okay with that. Well, the thing is... It's a conversation. It's a starting point. It's a conversation. And the important thing for the two of us in, in our relationship is to share meaning on all those things when we need to use the concepts. Right. So if we didn't get it right for for you out there listening to this, well... Just make sure that you're that the people you're talking with all agree on it. And that's then it. and that's that's all there is to it. It's now that said, I want to circle back to what we started with. Okay. Um treating each other mm -hmm. really beautifully. Treating each other with compassionate care. Actually doing that, actually acting on it is 
Well, I mean, it requires a lot of intentionality. Oh, yeah. But intention isn't enough. Intention is necessary, but not sufficient to create actually active, compassionate, caring, proactive relationships. Care takes work and attention. It's right. complicated. So when we're out there dating, it's really easy to accidentally hurt someone hurt someone by using a label on them, like by plastering a label on them, hurt someone by not actually disclosing what we're doing mm -hmm. early enough in the game. So one of the things we didn't discuss earlier, but really needs attention is your labels are yours and you may be taking time to figure them out. And along the way, you'll likely be experimenting and exploring and figuring out how to do this non-monogamy thing and so you have to figure out how you're going to express that to new people you're meeting and i don't just mean on a dating site because on a dating site you have the opportunity to put some labels down put some words down and then um you know at least there's some definition but what if you're just at a club or you're just out what like whatever um it can be really hard to know how much do i have to disclose and how soon <laughs> I have one of the things that has come up for several clients just in the last couple of years, especially post pandemic, um, a lot more people started trying different apps and some apps are designed, they were designed, like you can even go track down like what they were designed for by their makers and they were designed for monogamous connection. So people using them to try to make non-monogamous connection becomes really complicated and I'm not saying it's unethical just it's complicated because if the majority of people there are there to meet monogamous partners and now I'm there attempting to meet non-monogamous partners I'm gonna have a lot more explaining to do and I have to decide when in the relating to do that right yeah and otherwise people get really frustrated you've run up against this you have dating profiles up right now they clearly state, I've seen them. They clearly state that you are non-monogamous. They have my picture in them all over the place, too, mm -hmm. just for good measure. And I know you only did that because you had gotten quite a bit of attention from people who assumed you were single, yep. even though it says partnered and it says... Who were single and looking for a monogamous yeah. connection, like that's their goal. Um, and most of the time that resolves itself pretty easily in those early conversations yeah so those are those are and those are the clear situations and then it can get from there it just gets murkier where right you might not find out for a while exactly what somebody is looking for and so the thing is some people don't know what they're looking for yet. because that's one of the reasons that it and can be a while sometimes when yeah. people have creative monogamy agreements so i love creative monogamy i really do but if my creative monogamy allows me the the glory, the joy of going out and going to clubs and dancing and making out and, and hanging out. What's my obligation to tell other people before I'm dancing and making out with them and buying them drinks? And and you so you started talking about applying labels to people and and that includes like, do I assume this person is monogamous? And that that's the context of what we're doing right now? And that we're like, I'm already on the first step of the relationship escalator, or are we just fooling around? And how do you find and out? What does that even mean? Fooling around? What do you mean? I never know what you mean when you say that. I never do. I've, I've never understood what he means because you have used that label to cover a lot of stuff. I Or this is just a temporary thing, not, not something that's designed to lead to the next thing. So if, even if people though are not adhering to a strict relationship escalator, ideal right where they're imagining that that the eventual goal of all relationships is to find out if you're someone's life partner or not there's still this murky ground mm -hmm. where we're not even dating yet what are we doing we're like we're enjoying erotic space together or conversational space one of the things i do is wear my wedding ring which i don't actually care about i, I mean i care about it i i love you and I like that you gave me this ring that I picked out for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, Which was just smart. Yeah, it's my ring. Yeah, you like it. Um, 
I really do. And I do like wearing it, but I mostly wear it because it's, I find it easier to be flirting with someone who's looking at me wearing a wedding ring and I can disclose very early I'm wearing a wedding ring and I'm polyamorous and here's how that looks for me. It also makes it much harder to date people like up, like in the, like to just yep. be out in the world and making those connections. When but we... I think that's a good thing for me because I, I would rather err on the side of having to experience Blame myself because people who are feeling well held by the monogamous culture it's like my my role in the world is not to disrupt them my role in the world is to disrupt disrupt my own mm -hmm. internalized right. monogamy and to help people who've elected that so it's a it's a tricky thing but i don't i don't know what the answer is like literally if i'm at a club when do I need to disclose? Yeah. How much bumping and grinding can I do before I need to disclose <laughs> that you're going to be home when I get there? Like and we um when we first started um uh, dating, like dating other people and trying to figure out how the polyamory like works outside of our like out triad, there. uh, we would talk about, oh, if only there were some uh, some some signal something we could wear or something that people could look at and identify us as polyamorous so that we could we could leapfrog some of the the confusion that might come up at the beginning and there's there's a couple things that have there's come all down symbology. but it but it's not so universal so um like the infinity sign around the mm -hmm. heart is also used by several other groups right. including like grieving groups and yeah so so yeah and um there is a new polyamorous flag so yep. um pretty cool just google polyamorous flag there's a new one um and i think it's it's done a much better job of representing like what yeah. the values of polyamory but still <laughs> but that that's a you you bring up a good point of, of taking care of each other like how how do we um carefully engage with people like with care um and make things as clear as possible without so i want to come back to the word intentionality there we go so if i'm clear on my intentions it's still there's still all this room between my intentions and your assumptions yes and when we're meeting for the first time i can't make assumptions about what your assumptions are right and at the same time when we're out in the world, we're all bumping up against each other. What I don't like is to feel used. Mm -hmm. Used for someone else's um, in intentional exploration without explicitly communicating that. I will absolutely participate in someone's intentional exploration if they can tell me that that's what they're doing. I have definitely been many women's first woman <laughs> and that's fine with me it's more than fine if they tell me that but if they're doing it and they tell me they want a girlfriend and then I don't see them again yeah and that's also happened quite a few times that's ouchy it is really ouchy and it, and and there's the thing being someone else's experiment is hard figuring out how to treat each other humanely while we're having relationships, this isn't just a non-monogamy thing. No, it isn't. This is a people thing. And of all the things that we've said. And some of us like to be objectified, but not all the time. <laughs> right. I'll raise my hand. Sure. Not all the time, though. And not by strangers. For me. Mm -hmm. And the things that you've described, um, the, uh, the, the, the core, the, like the, the fundamentals of care are uh, communicating like so you can't make assumptions about my assumptions but i can tell you what they are like if i start volunteering information and and you do and we have conversations it's uh easier to so it gets be us careful. closer it gets us closer and then i guess the last piece i would put in there is what's my repair plan mm. if i accidentally cause harm and for some people they're not going to want your repair mm -hmm. the best you can do is offer an apology and exit yeah Yep. Because you caused harm. Get, like, leave them alone. Um, 
For other people, they may want an actual repair plan. And then what are you going to do for yourself if you recognize that you've caused harm? If you used someone, if you did not communicate appropriately with someone, if you recognize, even ages later, if you recognize that you harmed someone, there's no reason not to offer an apology. And someone might be mad that you that you did even that. And yep. Yeah. This is what it is to be human. It's yes. Not, it's not it's not necessarily going to be easy. <laughs> I am glad we had this conversation. I know it went on for a long time. There's a lot to discuss here. The taxonomy of relationship structures. Here we have it. Can see how it would go on. Questions about specific ones. I thoroughly encourage you to reach right out to us. And if you are one of those people who is on the fence about whether non-monogamy is the right choice for you, head on over to joliquiz.com, J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com, because I have a quiz for you to figure out where you are in the process of, from like, on the spectrum from like, oh, absolutely not, we're, we're not, I'm not ready, over to, yeah, hell yeah, let's figure out how we do this now. Well, go find out. And then we can talk about all these structures again in a more nuanced way. Yeah. <laughs>